Hello everyone. Previously in this video series on genetics, we have covered how DNA is passed on from parents to offspring according to Mendelian inheritance. However, as we have mentioned, there are many exceptions to Mendel's rules, such that Mendelian inheritance is actually the exception and not the rule. Well, here we will look at yet another and very unintuitive exception. So let's jump right in. Horizontal gene transfer, or HGT for short, is the movement of DNA, or RNA, between genomes as opposed to vertical gene transfer from parent to offspring via sexual or asexual reproduction. HGT is very counterintuitive to how we usually think DNA is inherited. Ironically, HGT played a key role in the historical discovery of DNA as the material of inheritance. British medical officer Frederick Griffith performed an experiment in 1928 that involved mice and two strains of Streptococcus pneumoniae, one pathogenic and one that was harmless. His experiment showed that when the pathogenic strain was killed and its remains were mixed with living cells of the harmless strain, some of the living cells had become pathogenic and this change was inherited. This meant that some substance of the dead pathogenic strain causes a heritable change in the other strain that made it pathogenic. Griffith called this phenomenon transformation, but it was only later confirmed that transformation involved the uptake of naked DNA from the environment. In addition to transformation, the main mechanisms of HGT employed by bacteria are transduction and conjugation. Transduction involves a virus that transports DNA from one bacterium to another. In conjugation, two bacterial cells make physical contact, often with a structure called a pilus, through which they exchange DNA. Thus, while HGT can occur passively, bacteria employ mechanisms to actively promote HGT, and there are many reasons for this. HGT allows bacteria to evolve much faster than what would otherwise be possible. HGT was first widely recognized when multidrug resistance became an issue in the mid-20th century. Bacteria can, and have, evolved resistance via mutations, but HGT allows the genes that confer resistance to be transferred between different strains or species. Arguably the most infamous example of this is methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, better known as MRSA, which are resistant to beta-lactam antibiotics such as penicillin. These antibiotics work by binding onto and inhibiting transpeptidase enzymes that are involved in building peptidoglycan, without which the cell wall of gram-positive bacteria would break, causing the cell to leak and eventually die. However, MRSA strains have the MEK-A gene that codes for a transpeptidase that is not affected by beta-lactam antibiotics. This gene is part of a mobile genetic element called SCC that mediates HGT. It likely originated in other staph species, among which the MEK-A gene and mobile genetic element had independent histories before the mobile element captured the gene and was transferred to staph aureus. In addition to antibiotic resistance, HGT can also cause normally harmless bacteria to become dangerous pathogens, as was shown by Griffith's experiments. Take the most famous bacterium E. coli, for instance. Everyone harbors harmless strains of this species in their guts, which are actually beneficial, involved in such processes as producing vitamin K2, but others are killers. Among the most dangerous ones are the strains of the E. coli serotype O157H7, the CDC has estimated that these cause 73,000 illnesses, 2,200 hospitalizations, and 60 deaths annually in the United States. They are transmitted via the oral fecal route and are typically caught via the consumption of contaminated raw vegetables, raw or undercooked meat, and raw milk. Infections can be asymptomatic or cause mild diarrhea. However, in some cases, it can lead to severe bloody diarrhea and can progress into a life-threatening condition called hemolytic uremic syndrome that is characterized by the destruction of blood cells and acute kidney failure. These symptoms are caused by the Shiga toxin that these bacteria produce. The Shiga toxin disables the ribosome, thereby inhibiting protein synthesis, without which the cell is unable to maintain vital processes and it dies. 
This is very similar to how ricin works, a plant toxin made famous in recent pop culture by the show Breaking Bad. However, Shiga toxins need to attach onto specific membrane receptors in order to enter cells, which ruminants don't have. For this reason, infected cows won't exhibit any symptoms and cattle are the main reservoir for this disease, even if they are healthy. To make things worse, the STX genes that code for Shiga toxins are carried around by bacteriophages, which transmit them between bacteria. This was part of the 2011 outbreak of a new strain of E. coli, O104H4, in Germany, that was spread by contaminated organic veggies. It was later found that this novel strain had acquired the Shiga toxin genes via transduction mediated by these bacteriophages. HGT is thus very important to the evolution of prokaryotes, and it can have some major consequences. Through HGT, genes can be readily gained and lost, and genes are transferred between species, sometimes between ones that are very distantly related. Because of this, two strains of even the same species can differ widely. Take E. coli again. The genome of one individual consists of some four to 6,000 genes. However, typically far less than half of an individual's genome is universally shared, and the total number of unique genes in the entire E. coli gene pool can be two times or more than 10 times greater, depending on how much of the gene pool you sample. A large fraction of these extra genes originated from other species. This is why it is not appropriate to say that there is an E. coli genome. Rather, geneticists differentiate the universally shared part as the core genome and the total set of unique genes present in the gene pool as the pan genome. Although every species technically has a core genome different from the pan genome due to individual variation, the relative size between these is different for different species. For example, every one of us pretty much shares the same set of genes. In this respect, there is virtually no difference between the core and the pan genome. However, protein coding genes only comprise about 2% of human genomes. There is more variability in the intergenic regions, but even then, about 98.7 to 99.5% of one individual's genome is universally shared by all other humans compared to E. coli, which typically far less than 50% of an individual's genome is universally shared. One reason for this difference is that HGT occurs much less frequently in some organisms. These don't often receive genes from other species, which makes their genomes more evolutionarily stable. This is especially the case for multicellular eukaryotes, whose genomes are shielded from HGT due to the distinction between somatic and germ cells. Most of their cells are somatic cells, which means most HGT events occur among somatic cells, which won't pass on their DNA for the same reason somatic mutations are not passed on. This is known as the Weissman barrier, which we covered in the previous video on genetic inheritance. However, even though it is rarer, HGT still occurs in multicelled organisms, and it had a significant role in their evolution as well. Retroviruses are a great example. Retroviruses reproduce by inserting their own DNA into a host genome, but sometimes the viral DNA is disabled, and it is stuck inside the genome. This is then known as an endogenous retrovirus, or ERV. ERVs make up about 5-8% to of the human genome, which doesn't seem like much, but it is more than the fraction that codes for proteins. Most ERVs carry only three genes. GAG, which codes for capsid proteins, Pole, which codes for a polyprotein that includes a reverse transcriptase, and ENV, which codes for the envelope spike proteins that facilitate cell entry by binding onto receptors of host cells. For most ERVs in our genome, these have become pseudogenes, but in some cases, they have been co-opted for a new purpose. For example, syncytin genes are co-opted ENV genes. Syncytins mediate the fusion between fetal and maternal cells in the formation of the placenta, similar to how ENV mediates the fusion of the virions with the host cell. Syncytins and ENV also share an immunosuppressive domain, which, as the name implies, suppresses the immune system. This is obviously beneficial for viruses, but this is also important for placenta formation, such that it is not rejected by the maternal immune system. What's more, eutherian mammals have obtained syncytins via HGT multiple times during their evolutionary history. But this isn't just the case for viruses. 
Meet Agrobacterium. This little bacterium makes a living by infecting plants. It inserts a piece of its TI plasmid into a plant cell using a type 4 secretory system, and the DNA ends up in the nucleus. The transferred DNA carries genes for plant hormones like cytokinin and auxin that become highly expressed. Because of this, infected cells will grow and divide uncontrollably, leading to tumor-like growths called GALs. In addition to the hormones, the transferred DNA also carries genes for the biosynthesis of opines, which is a carbon and nitrogen source that most other organisms cannot digest. In other words, agrobacterium genetically modified its host into a biofactory that produces food for the bacterium. It turns out that in some cases, plants can obtain genes from agrobacterium and pass them on permanently. This has been determined in plants such as the sweet potato. Since agrobacterium is so good at inserting genes into plants, it is not surprising that this bacterium has been used in biotechnology to express specific genes in plants, including in the development of golden rice, which is a rice that is able to produce beta-carotene, a metabolic precursor to vitamin A. Golden rice was developed to address vitamin A deficiency that affects millions of people, and in some cases can lead to blindness. It was recently approved for human consumption in the Philippines. Though it is very rare, HGT can also occur from one multicellular eukaryote to another. A good example of this is seen in parasitoid wasps. Yes, those nightmarish wasps that made Darwin doubt the existence of an all-loving god. They lay their eggs inside the bodies of living caterpillars and, after hatching, the larvae first eat the non-vital organs keeping the host alive for as long as possible. Yikes. But it gets worse. Some parasitoid wasps have viruses that are part of the wasp genome. Inside the ovaries, the wasps produce virions, which are injected along with the eggs into the caterpillar. The virions lack the needed genes to reproduce themselves inside the caterpillar, but they are still able to suppress the caterpillar's immune system, without which the larvae would be killed. However, it turns out that at some points in the evolution of some lepidopteran groups, the caterpillars survived, and they received virus genes from these wasps, which could make them more resistant against other viruses. Other examples include aphids, that are able to produce organic pigments called carotenoids, which nearly all other animals are unable to do. Aphids receive the necessary genes to produce carotenoids from fungi. White flies received a detoxification gene from plants that makes these white flies able to neutralize plant toxins. And an antifreeze gene has been passed to red herrings and from red herrings to smelt fish. This serial transfer was facilitated by transposable elements, or so-called jumping genes. Ferns have received neochrome from hornworts. Neochrome is a fusion between a phytochrome and a phototropin. Most plants have phototropin receptors, which enables them to detect and seek more light. However, phototropins can only sense blue light. Phytochromes are red light detecting. This fusion in neochrome makes it able to detect both red and blue light, which enables better detection of light under low light conditions. The original fusion occurred in hornworts, but neochrome was transferred to ferns about 180 million years ago. The researchers suggested that this enabled ferns to thrive and diversify in the shaded environment under the canopy of flowering plants. HGT is also thought to have played a major role in the origin of eukaryotes themselves. We have discussed endosymbiosis before on this channel, where the mitochondria and later chloroplasts were originally bacteria that were engulfed inside the cells of eukaryotes. But this picture has been updated in recent years. We have found out that the original host cell belong to the other prokaryote group, Archaea, specifically the Asgard Archaea, or Asgard Archaeota. These Asgard Archaea include Loki Archaeota, Thor Archaeota, Odin Archaeota, and the recently discovered Wukong Archaeota, arguably the best named group of prokaryotes. The major reason for this change is the discovery that these prokaryotes possess many eukaryotic signature proteins or proteins that were once thought to be unique to eukaryotes. With this new insight, we see that eukaryotes originated via an endosymbiotic relationship with bacteria and later became the mitochondria, archaea as a host. 
The genetics of eukaryotes also reveal this chimeric origin between archaea and bacteria as a big portion of eukaryotic genes are more similar to that of bacteria and a small portion is more similar to that of archaea. The bacterial genes are mostly involved in cellular energetics and metabolism, while the archaeal genes are involved in the information systems of DNA, transcription, and replication of eukaryotes. What's more, different genes are from different groups of bacteria and archaea, which means that HGT occurred between many bacteria and archaea at the root of eukaryote evolution. But if bacteria became the mitochondria, then why does the nucleus contain so many bacteria-like genes while the mitochondrial genome is so small? Well, most of the genes that were originally in the mitochondria were transferred to the nucleus, which is a type of HGT called endosymbiotic gene transfer. Even many proteins that mainly function inside the mitochondria are encoded by nuclear genes. That's why it was possible for mitochondria to lose their genes to the nucleus. However, if that is the case, then why do some genes still remain in the mitochondria? This is answered by the co-location for redox regulation, or core, hypothesis. The genes that are still left in the mitochondria often encode proteins that are part of the respiratory chain complexes. The core hypothesis states that the genes and their protein products being close to each other within the mitochondria allows for gene regulation to be coupled with the redox state of the proteins, without which the mitochondria would be unable to properly function. Lastly, we need to discuss some phylogenetic shenanigans. We are all familiar with the Tree of Life. Arguably the most famous one was constructed by the late Carl Woese, who together with George E. Fox discovered the third domain of Archaea in the 1970s. That revolutionary discovery, as well as this Tree of Life with eukaryotes being sister to the Archaea, was based on sequences of the 16S ribosomal RNA. However, the reality of HGT is a problem for the validity of such phylogenies based on single sequences. We have already seen that more recent evidence with more data shows that eukaryotes aren't sister to the archaea, instead they are derived from endosymbiosis involving both bacteria and archaea. But HGT has more implications. Phylogenies exhibit branching tree-like patterns, which is why a universal phylogeny, such as that of Woese, are often referred to as a tree of life. But some scientists challenge the validity of any tree of life. Among them is W4 Doolittle, who proposes that due to HGT, there is no one tree of life. Instead, it is more like a tangled network with no single root or trunk, meaning the last universal common ancestor, or Luca, was not a single individual. Instead, Luca was a community and the collective of genes which were inherited and transferred around the web of life. Discussions over the shape of the tree of life have continued since. But then there was this article by New Scientist published in 2009 titled Darwin was wrong cutting down the tree of life. The content of that article wasn't the problem in particular, it pretty much explained the same thing about HGT and how it affects the tree of life. However, while New Scientist is mostly good, it is still a pop journal and does not refrain from spicing things up a bit to boost its sales. And that's what the cover was for, which tells a completely different story. New Scientist received severe criticism from several evolutionary biologists like Richard Dawkins, Jerry Coyne, PZ Myers, and Daniel Dennett, explaining that the cover was extremely misleading and would give anti-evolutionists a golden opportunity to mislead the public. Indeed, creationists ran with the cover of this article declaring the death of Darwinism, by which they mean all of evolutionary biology. What's frustrating is that the editor of the article itself anticipated that this would happen. Quote, As we celebrate the 200th anniversary of Darwin's birth, we await a third revolution that will see biology changed and strengthened. None of this should give sucker to creationists whose blinkered universe is doubtless already buzzing with the news that new scientist has announced Darwin was wrong. Expect to find excerpts ripped out of context and presented as evidence that biologists are deserting the theory of evolution en masse. They are not. Close quote. But this statement didn't matter. The damage was already done, and over a decade later, creationists still use HGT as an argument against common ancestry to this very day. And Ford Doolittle specifically often gets name dropped in quote mind. Last year, we addressed such arguments from one self described ID proponent who cited Doolittle to cast doubt on the validity of phylogenetics. 
They say that phylogenetic trees showing relationships between groups could easily be the result of HGT instead of common descent. However, as we've discussed here, HGT in multicellular eukaryotes is relatively rare. For this reason, their phylogenies are very much tree-like. Even Ford Doolittle states the following, Quote, to be sure, much of evolution has been tree-like and is captured in hierarchical classifications. Although plant speciation is often affected by reticulation and radical primary and secondary symbioses lie at the base of the eukaryotes and several groups within them, it would be perverse to claim that Darwin's tree of life hypothesis has been falsified for animals, the taxon to which he primarily addressed himself, or that it is not an appropriate model for many taxa at many levels of analysis, close quote. Secondly, phylogenetics has progressed a lot since Carl Woese discovered Archaea at a time when we could only analyze limited sequence data. Phylogenetic analyses today use many thousands of sequences and the methods are based on statistics in order to distinguish the signal of common ancestry from the noise. And noise in data is always expected. HGT is one source of noise, and we are also aware of others such as incomplete lineage sorting. That's another reason why gene trees don't always match species trees. What actually matters is whether the data give strong statistical support for tree-like phylogenies in spite of the noise. This is exactly what the work of Eugene Koonin and colleagues shows. They examined genomes of 100 species of prokaryotes, 41 archaea, and 59 bacteria. From this, they obtained almost 7,000 individual trees, each based on individual genes or groups of genes. These were named the forest of life. Most of these trees don't include all 100 species, since most genes each species has aren't universally shared. But there is a set of 102 trees, each including over 90 species, which are based on genes involved in transcription and translation. These trees are referred to as nearly universal trees of life. These still aren't all identical to each other, and some relationships within the trees are difficult to discern, which is likely in part due to the noise from HGT. Nevertheless, the nearly universal trees are largely consistent with each other and also highly similar to many other trees of the forest of life. These tend to converge upon the same consensus tree of life. Furthermore, each individual tree deviates from the statistical tree of life in a random-like fashion, which means that HGT alone cannot explain this statistical trend between the trees. Quoting from one of their papers, Quote, a comprehensive comparative analysis of a forest of 6,901 phylogenetic trees for prokaryotic genes revealed a consistent phylogenetic signal, particularly among 102 nearly universal trees, despite high levels of topological inconsistency probably due to horizontal gene transfer. Horizontal transfer seemed to be distributed randomly and did not obscure the central trend. Close quote. There you have it. HGT has played a major evolutionary role in the history of life. Although HGT has made phylogenetics more complicated, phylogenetics still supports universal common descent nonetheless. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.